Luke chapter 9, verse 18. And God's word says, Once when Peter was praying in private and his disciples were with him, he asked them, Who do the crowd say I am? They replied, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others that one of the prophets of long ago has come back to life. But what about you? he asked. Who do you say I am? Peter answered, the Christ of God. But Jesus strictly warned them not to tell this to anyone. Then he said, the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests and the teachers of the law, and that he must be killed, and on the third day, be raised to life. Then he said to them all, If anyone would come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for me will save it. What good is it for a man to gain the whole world and yet lose or forfeit his very self? If anyone is ashamed of me and my words, the Son of Man will be ashamed of him when he comes in his glory and in the glory of the Father and of the holy angels. I tell you the truth, some of those, some, some, some who are standing here will not taste death before they see the kingdom of God. This is God's word. When God's word is read, God speaks. I'm sure you all know what it is to have a life-changing moment, a particular moment in time when life was never the same again. For, for some of you, for example, the day you uttered the words, I do, life was never the same again, was it? <laughs> or maybe when you looked at the test and with teary eyes you said, we're having a baby. Life was never the same again. These are moments that many of us have experienced and we all have individual moments. We all have our own experiences that we, we could say on top of these. For, for myself, for example, life was never the same after one Sunday afternoon. My wife handed me a copy of the Evangelicals Now and said, Read that advert from a church in Derby. It's got your name written all over it. Life was never the same again. In our passage today, we see that Peter's life was never the same again after he confessed that Jesus was the Lord, that Jesus was the Messiah from God. Not only Peter's life was changed, but the whole of Jesus' ministry was changed as well as his disciples finally understand, understood who Jesus really was. From that moment on, this, this moment in Luke's Gospel, it's a hinge. It changes everything. There's a much greater intensity. And as Jesus resolutely faced Jerusalem and the cross, from this moment on, life was never the same again. So we're going to consider this passage under two headings. We're going to consider... Jesus says, I'm the king, but I'm going to the cross. And if you want to follow me, you're going to have to do exactly the same. If you want to follow me, you will have to come to the cross too. So number one, I'm the king, but I'm going to the cross. A few weeks ago, we had a general election and we all know how that went. If someone asked you who won the general election, then your probable answer would either be Theresa May or the Conservatives, okay, as a general statement. But if they said, who did you vote for, that's very different, isn't it? From a general statement to a very personal one, who won the general election is one answer, but who did you vote for yourself makes it very personal. And that's exactly what Jesus is doing here. He asks a general question, who do the people say I am? But then he looks Peter in the eye and says, what about you? Who do you say I am? A general question becomes very personal. So we see Jesus has been privately praying. We don't, we're not told what he was praying about, but I wonder if he was praying, Father, open their eyes. Open their eyes and let them finally see who I am. 
And after praying, he looks at them and says, verse 18, who do the crowds say I am? Well, the disciples have a ready-made answer. Perhaps they've done some kind of Gallup poll research and they have an answer and say, yes, some say it's John the Baptist, others say it's Elijah, and some others say a prophet from long ago. Well, that's fair enough. At least they're saying it's somebody significant, somebody from God. At least they didn't say, ah, oh, the people, they're, they're talking about you, Jesus, they're talking about this carpenter from Nazareth. At least they didn't say that. But he looks them in the eye and says, what about you? What about you? Who do you say I am? It's okay what the people say, but you're my guys, you're my disciples. Who do you say I am? And without hesitation, Jesus says, you're the Christ of God. You're the Christ of God. This is wonderful. At last, the pieces of the jigsaw have fallen into place. At last, the dots have been joined as they understand that Jesus is the Christ of God. Now, the word Christ, what does that mean? It's not Jesus' surname. In the, the, the Nazareth telephone directly, directory, he would not be listed under C as Jesus Christ. It's not his surname. Christ is, uh, is, is a Greek word that means God's chosen son, God's chosen king. The Greek word Christ means God chosen king, but the Hebrew word Messiah is exactly the same word but in a different language and it also means God's chosen king. So the Greek word Christ, God's chosen king, we know that name regularly, we hear that often, but the, the Hebrew word Messiah means exactly the same thing, God's chosen king. The one that the Jews have been waiting for for 2,000 years or more. At last, at last they've recognised who he is. Time for great celebration, you would think. But he strictly warns them, don't say a word. Not a word about this to anyone, guys. Verse 21, Jesus strictly warned them not to tell this to anyone at all. Now why would he do that? Why would Jesus say, excellent, that's fantastic, but keep it a secret? Why would he do that? Surely he'd, he'd want to say, great stuff, guys, now go and tell everybody. We'll go, in, you, you, you guys each go in a different direction, and I'll go in another one, 13 different directions. We'll cover this land in a week. Go and tell everybody. He didn't say that. He said, don't tell anybody at all. I think the reason why he said keep it quiet would be for two reasons. The first one is the people, the Jews, they wanted the Messiah to be a king like David was back in the Old Testament, a military leader. The people wanted the Messiah to be a military leader. They wanted a military leader because they believed that their biggest problem in society was the oppression by the, the, the Roman authorities who had taken over their land. So what they wanted, more than anything else, was that someone, the Messiah, would start an uprising against the Romans. They would overthrow the Romans and then they could be a major player on the world, on the world stage again. But Jesus wasn't that kind of Messiah, was he? He wasn't that kind of Messiah. He came to deal with a, a bigger problem than the Romans occupying their land. The bigger problem is that he came to deal with our sin. Jesus came to deal with our sin. And he could only do that by dying on the cross in your place. Not by leading an army, but by resolutely going to the cross. <coughs> That's the mighty military ruler was not what the Old Testament scriptures would say. And Jesus was actually bound by the Old Testament scriptures. He lived his life and he faced his death in accordance with the Old Testament scriptures. He was bound by them. He could not do other. And so he couldn't raise up an army. He had to go to the cross because that's what the scriptures said. I think the second thing that he said, keep it under your hats for now, was that if they went rushing off by themselves, they would make a mess of it. 
didn't Jesus say virtually his last words to them in Acts chapter 1 was, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and then you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Wait until the Holy Spirit comes to empower you, then you can go. Okay? So I think that's the two reasons. The people wanted a military ruler and they needed to be filled with the Holy Spirit because by themselves they'd make a mess of it. He says, wait until the Holy Spirit comes, then you'll change the whole world. But you're not ready yet, so don't tell anyone. And Jesus poured even more cold water on the disciples in verse 22. And he said, the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the teachers of the law. And he must be killed and on the third day be raised to life. The Son of Man must suffer many things. Now we know that Jesus often called himself the Son of Man. We regularly hear that from the pulpit that that was Jesus' favourite name for himself, wasn't it? Which it was. Now to our ears... The phrase son of man thinks that he's identifying himself with us. That he's, he's identifying himself as a man, as a human. And that's <coughs> nice, isn't it? It's lovely that Jesus wants to be one of the boys. It's a bit like when Prince Harry plays with those street kids from Lesotho. And say, oh, isn't that nice? He's just like us. Is that what goes through your mind when we hear Jesus describing himself as the son of man? He's just one of the boys. It's great, isn't it? But of course, no, it's much deeper than that. When Jesus used the term son of man, what he had in mind was the prophecy from Daniel chapter 7. Daniel chapter 7, Daniel writes, In my vision at night I looked and there before me was one like a son of man coming with the clouds of heaven. He approached the Ancient of Days and was led into his presence. He was given authority and glory and sovereign power and all nations and peoples of every language worshipped him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away and his kingdom is one that will never be destroyed. Now when we see this, this is, this is very different from Jesus claiming to be one of the boys, isn't it? <laughs> This is so, he's describing himself as a, as a d divine messianic figure, one who approaches the Ancient of Days boldly. That's Almighty God. And he comes with a whole host of angels to restore order to God's world. And he's worshipped by all the nations and his dominion will never end. This is a big deal. This is what Jesus has when he, in mind when he says, when he talks about himself being the son of man. This, this is huge, this is glorious, isn't it? It kind of makes you sit up and notice what he's saying and what he intends to do. And what he intends to do is something that no Jew had ever thought of. The Messiah was going to suffer and die. No Jew had ever thought of that, that the Messiah would suffer and die. This was a shock to the disciples' ears. I believe this was the very first time he says, he talks about his death in Luke's Gospel. It's the very first time he mentioned it. He mentioned it many times, but this is the first, and it's because of Peter's confession. You are the Christ. You get it? Now I can tell you what the plan is. I'm going to go to Jerusalem, and there I'll die, but I'll be raised three days later. But this is all a shock to the disciples' ears. They, they, they know a little bit about the suffering servant that Isaiah talks about. Do you remember at Easter we, we studied Isaiah 53, the, the, the clearest passage of the suffering servant, and we saw that it was describing the death of Jesus. But the Jews didn't see that. The Jews didn't, didn't bring together the suffering servant and the Messiah. They thought they were two different people. But Jesus is saying, no, it's me. I am the suffering servant, I am the Messiah. It's me, I am that one man. And it made no sense to Peter's ears that the Messiah should suffer and die. That's why when we read this story in Mark's Gospel, as soon as Jesus says, I'm going to suffer and die, what does Peter do? Well, Mark 8 verse 31, 
Jesus began to teach them that he must be killed and after three day, days rise again. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. Peter had been taught from his mother's knee that the Messiah would come and defeat evil and injustice by ascending to the throne, the throne of David. But Jesus is saying here, yes, I am the Messiah, I'm the king, but I'm not here to take power, but to lose it. I'm not here to rule, but to serve. I'm not here to live, but to die. And that's how I will defeat evil and restore order in God's world again. I am the suffering servant. I am the Messiah. I must die, but I will rise again. Now Jesus said he must die. He wasn't going to be trampled by a runaway donkey. He wasn't going to fall off a cliff. He wasn't going to get sick and grow old and die. No, he must die a horrible death on the cross. The writer to the Hebrews says in Hebrews 9, without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. Now what it implies here is that the, without the shedding of, without the violent shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. It means that the life of Jesus must be taken violently. It means he's going to die before his time is up. He's only 33 when he died. It means it's the most extreme price that anybody could ever pay. Our sin, your sin, my sin, is that serious that the Son of Man should die. It's the only way the price for our sin could be paid by Jesus. Oh, have a sin. So number two, if you want to follow me, you'll have to come to the cross too. Let's read verses 23, please, to 27. Verse 23, then after he said, then he said to all of them, if anyone would come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. Now whoever wants to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for me will save it. What good is it for a man to gain the whole world and, let, and yet lose or forfeit his very self? If anyone is ashamed of me, my words, a son of mine will be ashamed of him when he comes in his glory and in the glory of the Father and of the holy angels. I tell you the truth, some who are standing here will not taste death before they see the kingdom of God. Now if you were a marketing salesman, and you'd been there when Jesus said this. You'd probably rush up to Jesus and said, tone it down, mate, turn it down. If you want people to follow you, you're gonna to have to make it more appealing than that. But Jesus is insistent, whoever will follow me must deny himself and take up his own cross. That means every single Christian who's got to deny themselves and pick up their cross. Not just the, the super keen ones, not just the missionaries, not just the church leaders. Everybody, every single Christian, that means you and you and you, every single Christian has to deny themselves and pick up their cross and follow Jesus. John Stott, the respected Anglican minister, he said to deny yourself is to behave as Peter did to Jesus when he denied himself. No, absolutely, I don't know that guy, definitely not. You deny yourself that much. The verb is the same, it means to disown yourself, to deny yourself, to, to turn your back on yourself, renouncing our supposed right to go our own way. To deny yourself is to turn from the, get this, the idolatry of self-centeredness. It's a strong phrase. To deny yourself is to turn from the idolatry of self-centeredness. And I think we saw a very clear example of this in the world of politics just a few weeks ago. You all know that Tim Farron has been the, the leader of the Liberal Democrat Party for the last couple of years. And you may also know that Tim Farron is a, an evangelical Christian. He is, as we like to say. 
He's one of them born again types. During the election run up, Tim Farron was mercilessly hounded by the press as because of his biblical beliefs about homosexuality. Tim Farron believes what the Bible says about homosexuality, that the practice of it is sinful. But I think for political gain, Tim Farron caved in. He capitulated when he said that he did not believe that homosexual sex was a sin. But it appeared that this did not sit comfortably for him for the next few weeks. And so within a week of the election, he stood down as leader. And in his farewell speech, I do hope you've read it, I do hope you've seen it. You really must check it out if you haven't. In his farewell speech, a short extract is that he explained that he was the subject of suspicion because of what he believed and who his faith was in. He said, we are kidding ourselves if we think we live in a tolerant and liberal world society. To be a political leader, especially of a progressive liberal party in 2017, and to live as a committed Christian, to hold faithfully to the Bible's teaching, has felt impossible for me. Imagine how proud I am to be the leader of this party that I've been a member of since I was 16 years old. And imagine what would lead me to voluntarily relinquish that honour in the eyes of, in the words of Isaac Watts, he said, it would have to be something so amazing, so divine, it demands my heart, my life, my all. That's how he finished his, his resignation speech. To deliberately quit, it would have to be for something so amazing, so divine, it demands my heart, my life, my all. I think that is a brilliant example of what it means to, to deny yourself and pick up your cross and follow Jesus Christ. When Jesus said, that you and I must pick up our cross and follow him daily. He was speaking in the starkest terms. The Romans, we know, forced a condemned man to, to, to carry the, the horizontal piece of the cross to the execution site. And if you saw anybody carrying the cross piece, you know, it was a, they were on a one-way trip to death. In the USA, when somebody takes their last walk to the electric chair and all the other prisoners cry, Dead man walking! Dead man walking! If you're a Christian here today, the Lord Jesus expects you to be a dead man walking. To pick up your cross and deny yourself. What does he mean? What does Jesus mean when he says, Pick up your cross? And follow him. He didn't mean that you, you cope with a particular problem. We hear our friends say, when if we have a difficult relationship with somebody, they say, oh, that's your cross to bear. Or if you've got a thankful boss or an illness, oh, that's, that's the cross I have to bear. You say with as much self-pity in your voice as you can get away with. Jesus wasn't talking about that. I think Jesus, for some of you, men picking up your cross and following him means that a close friend might no longer want to associate with you anymore. Or maybe a family cuts you off because you wonder if Jesus freaks. For some of you to deny yourself and pick up your cross, it might mean that you, you lose your reputation at work or you lose that promotion at work that you've worked so hard to get. For some of you to deny yourself and pick up your cross daily, it might mean tithing for the first time properly. Or it might be going overseas to play your part in world mission. For some of you to pick up your cross and follow Jesus might mean buying a slightly older car and giving the difference to world missions 
or maybe to a struggling family that you know. For some of you to deny yourself and pick up your cross, it might mean rolling up your sleeves and being involved in Derby City Mission or the, the Padley Centre. For some of you to, to deny yourself and pick up the cross, it might mean training to go into full-time church leadership. I don't know what it is for you. It's something we, we need to pray about. But it has to be daily. It has to be daily. 20 years ago, Matt Redman wrote a song called Show Me the Way of the Cross. And the second verse in particular certainly resonates with me. Matt Redman wrote, Show me the way of the cross once again, denying myself for the love that I've gained. Everything is you now. Everything has changed. It's time you had my whole life. You can have it all. The trouble is, though, I've given like a beggar and lived like the rich. I've crafted myself a more comfortable cross. Yet what I'm called for is deeper than this. It's time you had my whole life. You can have it all. You can have it all. Have you crafted yourself a comfortable cross? But you know, th this is not new, new to us. To deny yourself is not something new to us. To go back to the very, very beginning, when I use the example of marriage and children, if you're married, you know what it is to deny yourself. If you have children, you know what it is to deny yourself a hundred times a day. So we, we, it's not new to us. We know what it is to deny ourselves for other people. <coughs> Jesus asks us to deny ourselves for him. Follow this master. Pick up your own cross. Ask him in prayer what that really means for you in particular. But it has to be specific. You can't just go on plodding on. But when you ask him, ask him with a glad heart. Because whatever he asks you to deny will be good for you and it will be for his glory. He is a good master. By denying, by, sorry, by dying on the cross, Jesus, Jesus saved us certainly. By dying on the cross, Jesus forgives all of our sins and that's wonderful. But it's more than that. It's more than that. He loves you too much to leave you as you are. He wants you to change. He wants you to become more like him. So as we follow this loving master, it will be for our good. It will be for his glory and for the expansion of his kingdom. As then people will be drawn to him like a moth for a f to a flame as they see the change in your life. It will be for your, your good and for his glory as we pick up our cross and deny ourselves daily. He's a wonderful saviour and he's worth it.